While the Cold War is going on during Unit 8, the other major component is decolonization. And I mean major. With the Cold War, we are talking mostly about the United States and the Soviet Union and how that rivalry really bled into other nations. But decolonization involved so many nations that we would be here a very long time if we talked about them all. Between 1945 and 1960, roughly 36 new states in Africa and Asia achieved independence from their European colonial rulers. I cannot talk about all those 36 stories, much less could you really retain all that information in your brain. So this video is my attempt to highlight a few of those stories that will overlap with the key concepts of 8.5, decolonization, 8.6, new states, and 8.7, resistance to power. It will not be fully inclusive by any means of all the parts of those learning targets. So check out my Unit 8 review video for kind of a big picture review. We're just gonna dig a little bit deeper in this one. Now, we always have to start with context. And the biggest two events when we're talking about decolonization in the regards to context is one, colonization. Obviously, decolonization is the undoing of colonization. And understanding how major nations, especially European nations, expanded their influences with their greedy eyes and gazed looks towards those resource-rich places in Africa and Asia um, because they were in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. Fast forward, World War I and World War II occurred in which these nations were involved and many colonized people fought in the war effort. Specifically with World War II, we know that most of the war was focused on stopping imperialist countries like Japan and Germany. And when the war was over, they looked at themselves in the mirror and realized, huh, Countries that expand and use other nations for their benefit. Wait a minute, we're doing that. We're still doing that. And so they decided maybe we should change something. Plus the reality is, is that most of these imperialist countries of Europe, they were broke from the war effort. And then they needed to rebuild their countries. And so to maintain these distant colonies would have been very difficult. Unfortunately, things did not move that fast, and nationalist efforts began to brew around the world. Nationalist leaders and parties in Asia and Africa sought varying degrees of autonomy within kind of the constraints of their colonizers' authority. This means they tried to rule themselves while still kind of being under the thumb of their colonizers. Others outright cut to the chase and sought independence from imperial rule. But how did they do that? Typically, two ways. After the end of World War II, some countries negotiated their independence while others achieved independence through an armed struggle. Some of the most prominent places to remember that negotiated their independence would be India, West French Africa, and Ghana. And unfortunately, the list of places that fought bloody wars and used armed struggle is also quite extensive. Places like Vietnam and Algeria, who fought against their French colonizers, as well as Zimbabwe and Kenya and Mozambique. But then there are groups that kind of overlap between these two camps, where you could make an argument either way, where they were kind of granted independence because they negotiated it, and it also was an armed struggle. But like I said, we are not going to cover all of those stories. I'm going to hit the big ones that kind of overlap with those concepts. This is really hard for me to whittle it down, but here are our winners. We are gonna focus on independence in India that was negotiated. Then we're gonna talk about armed resistance in Vietnam. And then we're gonna talk about the complex story which overlaps a little of both in South Africa. So let's start with India. We recall that European influence in the region started with trade and the British East India Company and what we'll call economic imperialism. The British are obtaining goods from India and then using them for their money-making ventures, which include things like cotton for textiles and let's not forget about their opium selling to China. But things changed in India after the Sepoy Mutiny in 1857. This event is viewed differently in the West as it is in India. We've often learned about this as kind of this uprising that was spurred by religious insensitivity when Indian soldiers who worked for the British were outraged that the cartridges that they were using were rumored to be greased with cow or pig fat, which led to an uprising. 
In India, many consider this is the first outbreak of an independence movement against British rule. Regardless, there becomes a shift to quell the Indian rebellion, and India shifts to an official colony in 1858 and will last until they negotiate their independence from Britain in 1947. But let's break it down of how we got there. One of the major nationalist leaders was Mohandas Gandhi, who in many ways kind of had an assimilationist view as he pushed for embracing the positive parts of British culture while rejecting their occupation in their country. He worked with the Indian National Congress, which was a political group of people that initially worked to have more representation of Indian interests while under the control of Britain. However, as time progressed, it became the leading nationalist group for independence. Gandhi as a leader believed in a unified India with Hindus and Muslims living together in harmony. He advocated for nonviolence and civil disobedience, which means to actively refuse to obey unjust laws, and then the willingness to accept the consequences for your actions. Two examples of civil disobedience led by Gandhi would be the homespun movement and the salt march. Gandhi preached to the Indian masses to spin and to weave their own clothes at, at home. The homespun movement. Gandhi was aware that as the British flooded India with cheap cotton textiles, it really just decimated Indian businesses and caused massive unemployment. Strategically, the homespun movement hit the British where it counted, in their pocketbook. Gandhi's most remembered act of civil disobedience was the Salt March. The British had this law that it would be a crime for anyone to purchase salt if it was purchased or made from anyone other than the British. <laughs> so in defiance, Gandhi led thousands of people on a 240 mile march to the sea where he would get there and then make salt from the sea. Like literally 240 miles. By the time he arrived, 10,000 people had joined in the march. This sparked a mass movement across the country for people to gather and make their own salt again, which again, hurt the British pocketbook. Now, Gandhi was arrested and jailed, which he accepted. And that's kind of integral to the whole idea of civil disobedience. But here's what's even crazier, is how his followers marched to take over the government's salt company. And when they got there, the British troops attacked them with clubs. And true to the principle of nonviolence, which Gandhi preached, they did not fight back and they just took the blows. Now, once again, Gandhi will then be released from prison and he's going to meet with the British Viceroy of India to negotiate their independence. He travels all the way to Great Britain um, as a representative of the Indian National Congress in 1931. And the British realize they can't really ignore this guy. However, if you notice that time, 1931, the world was in the middle of a global depression. And within 10 years, they're going to be back at war. After World War II was over, India achieved their independence from the British in 1947. The first prime minister was Prime Minister Nehru, who you may recall was one of the key figures in the non-aligned movement. But the outcome was slightly different than originally was planned, as two states were created, not just one. India, as well as West and East Pakistan, later known as Bangladesh. This event is also referred to as the Indian Partition. This was mainly due to the tensions between Muslims and Hindus in South Asia. The Muslim League was an organization much like the Indian National Congress. Its nationalist leader was Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who advocated for an independent Muslim state. He believed that Muslims would always be a minority group within India, and that would be an issue, so he sought for their own state. The British negotiated this deal between the various groups so that when independence was granted to India, it was also created in the drawing of a new state boundary for Pakistan. This negotiated independence was peaceful. However, I do want to quickly note that there were millions of people kind of living in the wrong side, and they were forced to migrate to a new place. Ethnic and religious violence did break out amidst the massive migrations where hundreds of thousands of people never actually arrived at their end destination. Con conflict was especially intense around the area of Kashmir and grew more intense when Pakistan and India uh, both developed nuclear weapons. So let's look at armed struggle. And Vietnam is gonna be the country we look at. 
Vietnam is in Southeast Asia and borders the country of Cambodia and Laos. The region was once referred to as Indochina, which alluded to the syncretic intermingling of Indian and Chinese influences in the region. Now, you may remember from earlier in this class where we talked about the Khmer Empire and the giant temple known as Angkor Wat back in Unit 1. And we can't forget how this region was also the region that gift the world Chamba Rice. But in the imperialistic age, Indochina became a region colonized by the French in 1858. Fast forward some more time, we know that World War I and World War II occur, where colonized people hoped that their dedication to the mother country would lead to their independence after the war. Well, Japan ended up expanding into Southeast Asia and into Vietnam. However, this regime collapsed at the Japanese surrender in August of 1945, marking the end of World War II. Now, on this exact same day, a Vietnamese nationalist, Ho Chi Minh, uh, proclaimed the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and assumed power. Ho Chi Minh was a communist, and the French were not okay with this plan. So they came back and reoccupied the region. Obviously, the Vietnamese were also not fans of the French coming back, and this led to an armed conflict known as the First Indochina War. It lasted for eight years as the French fought against the Viet Minh, who were seeking independence. The fighting was intense, and although the French were outnumbered, they did have superior weapons. Ho Chi Minh eventually was forced out of Hanoi and into the forests and mountains, and the war became more focused on guerrilla tactics. But in 1949, China won its civil war, and it became communist under Mao Zedong, which gave Ho Chi Minh an ally in the north and a supplier of weapons and supplies. Additionally, Joseph Stalin supported the leader as well. And so from early this unit, we know that this is all going to become a proxy war. But we aren't quite yet at the U.S. version of Vietnam yet. In the context of the Cold War, the U.S. begins to give aid to France in the form of weapons. Such a U.S. thing to do. Now, the armed struggle continues and leads to this stalemate. In 1954, the French, though, lose at Dien Bien Phu with many losses on both sides. Now, both sides came together to decide the terms to end the war, and at the 17th parallel north was the line that divided Vietnam into two zones, a communist North Vietnam and a pro-Western South Vietnam. Now, obviously, this may be new to you, as you may be more familiar with the Vietnam War from an American perspective. That will begin in less than a year from what we're talking about, and will continue for 20 more years until the United States leaves Vietnam. All this to say, I think Vietnam is a good example of how some countries achieved their independence through armed struggle. Finally, let's talk about probably my favorite topic, South Africa. In many ways, South African independence was negotiated, but it was also a brutal resistance campaign in many ways. It really depends on which perspective you look at it from. Recall that the Dutch established a colony at Cape Town in 1652. The goal was rounding Africa and making it into the Indies, and that was a really major effort during the time period. However, there's been some shifting power, and the British take the Cape Colony and then rule it in that area. Those Dutch descendants uh, that lived here were oftentimes known as the Boers, and they took this great trek inland in South Africa and took lands from the indigenous Kosa people. Uh, they will be known as Afrikaners in the future, and over time, these white Dutch settlers will find diamonds, and they're going to find gold, and will oppress the native populations. You will remember how these Dutch settlers were the first to run into resistance from another indigenous empire, the Zulu people, also in South Africa. Regardless, this story should sound slightly familiar from the past and what we've learned. White Europeans were taking land and resources that was not theirs. Now, all of this screams that decolonization of South Africa will not be simple. The transfer of power to an African majority was greatly complicated by the presence of these entrenched white settlers in South Africa. Some the Dutch, some the British. Now, politically, the British and the Afrikaners put aside their differences and unite to form the Union of South Africa and negotiate their independence from Britain in 1910, and it would remain part of the Commonwealth. 
British friends, feel free to throw in the comments below and really explain to us Americans who do not understand what the Commonwealth exactly is and how it's not still colonization. Either way. So we can support the claim that South Africa negotiated their independence. Well, minus the part where white people are still in control of South Africa. Indigenous Africans are denied rights by this minority power that's in control, and they will form the African National Congress to vocalize their wishes as African people. For example, in 1913, the Native Land Act made it so that a large majority of the Union's lands were exclusively for the white minority. The act effectively kind of shut down African rights to land and resources and also started up this idea that people were classified by their racial group. Now, the official Afrikaner party or the National Party started a policy of apartheid in 1948. This translates to apartness or separateness, which is basically a legal segregation based upon distinct racial classifications. According to the South African Population Registration Act of 1950, people were classified into one of four groups. Black. This group was made up of Native Africans, which were about 70% of the population. This included a lot of the major ethnic groups that you've probably heard of this year. Zulu, Kosa, Swazi, Dabeli, and many more. Uh, number two, there were those that were white roughly about 13% of the population at this time, with those people who were Dutch or British with those ethnic ties. Uh, three is other, mostly people who were Indian or Chinese who had migrated to South Africa due to jobs as indentured servants in the late 1800s and those who just traveled freely as merchants. And four, the final group is colored. That was about less than 10% of the population. Now, this one's a little tricky to understand as colored is different than perhaps what you think of in the United States as someone maybe who's mixed or biracial. But while that's somewhat true, in South Africa, someone who's colored is part of this very distinct cultural group. Colored people married other colored people. They spoke Afrikaans instead of native languages like Kosa. And to read more about this, I highly recommend, like just stop the video and look this up, Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. It is so, so good. I mean, like you don't even have to take my word, just go to Amazon and look up the book Born a Crime and it's like five stars on Amazon. I've never seen that where it's less than four and a half, but it is literally thousands upon thousands of reviews, five stars still. It's so good and you will learn so much. Recommendations after the AP test, pick up that book. While independence in 1910 was negotiated, a large majority of the population was essentially still under the control of the National Party, which was essentially the white settlers from generations ago. This will lead to a significant amount of pushback and resistance from the native population in the 1950s. Now this will look very similar to India where there will be non-violence movements and civil disobedience. In 1955, the ANC issues the Freedom Charter. I mean, listen to the preamble of the Freedom Charter. It sounds vaguely familiar. We, the people of South Africa, declare for our country and the world to know that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government can justly claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people, that our people have been robbed of their birthright to land, liberty and peace by a form of government founded on injustice and inequality, that our country will never be prosperous or free until all live in brotherhood, enjoying equal rights and opportunity, that only a democratic state based on the will of all the people can secure to all their birthrights without distinction on color, race, sex, or belief. Oh, so good. Sounds a lot like other documents, like, you know, the Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen as well. Guided by enlightenment and democratic ideals, the African National Congress set forth this seminal document, which was an ideal they were hoping for, but didn't quite have yet. Under apartheid, black South Africans were required to carry identification books with them at all times. And they were needed when they were going to enter a area designated for whites. They were forced to live in all black zones known as townships or Bantustans, and they could never have interracial 
relationships. Black people were not allowed to vote and a lot of their other rights were denied. Now, Nelson Mandela is a key leader in the ANC and sought to end these discriminatory practices. Like Gandhi, Mandela and his fellow members of the ANC used nonviolent tactics like strikes and demonstrations to protest apartheid. They even began a movement called the Defiance Campaign, which encouraged black participants to actively violate the unjust laws. More than 8,000 people, including Mandela, were jailed for violating curfews, refusing to carry their passbooks, and other offenses. One of the most famous acts of disobedience was in Sharpeville in 1960. Roughly 7,000 ANC members came to the police station to protest their ID passbooks and began to burn the passbooks in this act of civil disobedience, and then offering themselves up for arrest. Now, the police began to fire at the protesters, which claimed the lives of 69 people, wounding more than 180 more. Now, this led the National Party to outlaw the ANC as an organization. It's at this point that Mandela believes that peaceful methods and negotiation would not bring about change. So Mandela believed that armed resistance was the only way to end apartheid. In 1962, he briefly left the country to receive military training and gain the support for his cause, but was arrested and convicted after his return for leaving the country without a permit. Then, while he was in prison, police discovered documents related to Mandela's plan for guerrilla warfare. He was charged and sentenced to life in prison for his involvement and was sent to Robben Island. However, resistance, both peaceful and violent, continued. Again, you have to read Born a Crime by Trevor Noah, as there's so many incredible details about this story, and it's hilarious. And who doesn't want a book like that? Trevor, if you ever want to do a Zoom call with our class, we would love to have you anytime. It would be awesome. By the 1970s, resistance to apartheid increased. Organizing churches and workers increased. More white people joined blacks in demonstrating as allies. One of the other very famous events was in 1967 in Soweto. The National Party made a new law that required basically all kids to learn in Afrikaans, along with English, versus their native languages. Afrikaans was the language of the colonial oppressor. And in response to thousands of students, just like people your age, marched to demonstrate peacefully this government directive. Now, this march was meant to culminate at a rally at Orlando Stadium. However, along the way, they were met by heavily armed police uh, who fired tear gas and later live ammunition on students. This resulted in a widespread revolt that led people against the government. Now, over the course of the Soweto uprising, over 176 people were killed, many of them children. In fact, one of the most famous people killed was a 13-year-old boy known as Hector Peterson. He was not famous prior to the protests, but a journalist snapped this iconic photo of his unfortunate death at the hands of the police. He is carried by a stranger who was not at the protest, but an 18-year-old boy who had already graduated, and once hearing the gunshots and seeing Hector tried to save his life. The girl in the picture is Hector's sister, who didn't know her younger brother was even at the protest that day. Now, this is one of those pictures that changed history. The journalist was able to sneak a roll of film out in his sock, despite the others getting destroyed by the police. And the newspaper published the picture. Soon the world rose up against the injustice that was happening in South Africa. And by the 1980s, uh, hello, I was born then. People and governments around the world launched an international campaign to boycott South Africa. And it wasn't until F.W. de Klerk was elected as president in 1989 that the system began to be dismantled. The new president will free Nelson Mandela in 1990 and repeal the rest of the apartheid laws and call for a drafting of a new constitution in 1991, which was all a peaceful process. It's hard to say that true independence for South Africa was negotiated from the British as those white settlers continued to rule the country when it was granted. I'll argue it was a mix of negotiated independence, nonviolent protests and civil disobedient movements, and armed resistance that brought true decolonization to South Africa.
Now, it wasn't until 1994 that the first elections were held where all Africans could vote. The United Nations oversaw the elections to ensure fairness, and when it was all said and done, Nelson Mandela was elected with 63% of the vote after spending 27 years in prison on Robben Island. Now, my hope is that these deeper stories and case studies will make you feel more prepared and truly show how decolonization included negotiated independence, like we saw in India, armed resistance in Vietnam leading to decolonization from French oversight, and the complex story which overlaps a little of both of these in South Africa. Remember how students just like you can be involved in movements, protests, civil disobedience to create a more equitable world. Also, read Born a Crime over the summer break or whenever you can find time. It is totally worth it. And tr Trevor, the invitation is always open for you to visit our class virtually or in person if you ever want to come to Wisconsin. That can be on the table as well if you're interested. But thanks to everyone for stopping by. Check out my unit review videos to prep for your AP exam and subscribe to join the fam. Uh, be sure to take Trevor Noah on The Daily Show so that he gets our invitation to Wisconsin. I mean, we got cheese curds, other good stuff here. Anyways, we'll see you next time.